So Franklin is going to take a while to get going into modern urban issues. So I figured I'd start this series of uh, little planning snippets. These will be mostly applicable to North American cities. This episode is going to be a brief overview of parking, parking minimums, how to make realistic sized parking lots, and why realistic sized parking lots are dumb. I'll start by giving you my rule of thumb for parking lot size, show three specific cases in city skylines, and then we'll talk about how and why parking is the way it is and how it has affected cities. So uh, let's start with the rule of thumb. You need X amount of area of parking per each unit of floor area. X is somewhere between 0.75 and 2. You should stick with that. And I'll show you how this works in a moment while we look at three case studies. So uh, case number one is a large modern office block in a suburban greenfield site. Uh, you know, this is your standard cubicle farm or spreadsheet mine or what have you. Um, so this specific building is six blocks by four blocks and it's 11 stories tall. Now, what you can do is you can do the math on that and figure out how many blocks of parking you need, or you could do the easy thing and copy it 11 times since it uh, covers the full lot the whole way up. So that's what we're going to do. Now, once you've done that, I'd outline the space somehow. I use pedestrian paths. So you can use whatever you want. And then we're going to demolish all the uh, copied buildings we put in. And then we're going to figure out how to build the parking lot in this space. So just try and fill the space as best you can. There can be gaps. It's not a big deal. You know, sort of think about how people are going to use it. Uh, then you can go in and start putting the parking spaces in. Now, this is the important part. Don't forget the handicap spaces. If you don't add them, disabled Sims will not be able to get into your building. The Americans with Disabilities Act is an important piece of legislation that preserves equality in this country. So if you don't add the handicap spaces, I'm going to find out and I'm going to be unhappy. Anyway, uh, now that we've finished a parking lot, we can do some detailing on the space that's left over. So we're going to add some trees. We're going to add a couple more trees. We're going to add a couple signs. And some sad benches where you can sit and take your lunch. Deafened by the noise from cars on the suburban arterial road nearby. Wandering through the din where your life went wrong. How you ended up in this soulless place. As you eat your packed lunch. Tuna salad sandwich as always. And your boss glares at you from his corner office mentally preparing a list of cutting and personal insults to lob at you as punishment for returning from lunch break two minutes late. We're going to add some plants. Okay, looks like we're done. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what we did. Now, this is an 11-story building with a one-story lobby, so you figure there's 10 floors of offices. Now, we used a one-to-one -one floor area to parking area ratio, and we got 244 parking spots on a parking lot which is much, much larger than the building. But in real terms, this is actually a little small. Now, if there are only 24 people on each floor, every person gets a parking spot with four left over. But um, 24 people per floor on this building seems a little low. And uh, furthermore, a lot of municipal parking codes require more than one spot per worker in the building. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but these are things to consider when you're building your own parking lots. Case 2 is a seven-story residential rehab. It was originally a uh, warehouse. This building is three squares by four squares and is seven stories tall, so we'll need 84 squares of parking. To conserve space, we're going to use a multi-story parking garage for this. Now, my first step is to find a parking structure that you have plop it down, figure out how many squares worth of parking are in there. Now, this guy is four blocks by seven blocks by four stories tall. So that gives us 112 
uh, equivalent blocks of parking. That's more than the 84 required by the building. So we'll say, you know, the owner overbuilt it so he can have a parking structure that he can charge people to park at if they're going to uh, nearby stores or something. So let's go plop this guy down. Well, we got to figure out now the least destructive way to plop this uh, parking garage down. Uh, what we wind up doing uh, ends up demolishing six row houses and six small apartment buildings, which uh, displaces probably six businesses and easily 20 to 30 families. But, uh, you know, it's all worth it for some uh, extra parking. So overall, though, a few people had their livelihoods ruined, this has been a win-win for everyone. There's more parking in the neighborhood, and the owner even found a spot where he could throw some dumpsters for all the residential garbage from his rehab. We're going on to case three. Case three is a small-time landlord who wants to convert his underperforming uh, residential hotel into six two-bedroom luxury condos and uh, let's say two retail spaces on the ground floor. So uh, he's going to have to provide some parking for that. Let's see how he does it. So this building's two blocks by two blocks and it's four stories tall, but uh, we're going to say since it's got that L shape, the third block isn't occupied. So we're going to say it needs 12 blocks of parking. So uh, how is he going to uh, provide the parking? He's doesn't he doesn't have enough money for a multi-story garage so uh he uh acquires some of the nearby underperforming buildings demolishes them and puts in this nice surface lot and uh using some of the space left over he builds himself a nice loading dock for the um the two uh new businesses that are coming in he gets himself about 34 parking spots the low low price of four businesses and probably ten families displaced. With uh, 18 spaces for the six condos and 16 spaces for the two businesses, plus the loading dock, this neighborhood will never have to worry about their streets being blocked with parallel parkers or pesky loading trucks ever again. It was completely worth it. So uh, the amount of demolition we did may have seemed unreasonable to some of you all. However, uh, take a look at Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now take a look at New Haven, Connecticut. Now take a look at Detroit, Michigan. They have a hell of a lot of parking for very few buildings, and not much of that parking is in use. A huge amount of this comes down to one municipal policy, parking minimums. That is, policies which ensure that all new construction comes with a minimum amount of parking, depending on the use of the building. Now, I'm going to try and condense what Donald Shoup said in the high cost of free parking into less than five minutes. If you want a more thorough explanation, I suggest you read the book. Now, parking, especially free parking, is an inefficient land use. It produces little to no income. It takes up a huge amount of space. It is an impervious surface which increases stormwater runoff. It produces very little tax revenue, and it serves a limited number of people, namely those who felt the need to drag one and a half tons of metal and rubber with them on the way to their destination. Now, parking regulations go back to 1928 with the first metered street parking. Parking minimums are a form of parking regulation whereby a certain amount of parking is required according to the use of a building. A movie theater has a different parking requirement to a funeral home, which has a different parking requirement to a factory, and so on. Uh, municipalities may require, say, one parking spot per office worker, or one parking spot per X square feet office space, or one and a half parking spots per residential bedroom, or two parking spots per hospital bed, or five parking spots per bowling alley lane, or whatever. There's not a lot of consistency between codes other than what municipalities have copied from other municipal codes rather than running their own parking studies. Uh, these parking minimums are typically extremely generous. For instance, the luxury condo from before had 18 spaces between six condos. 
which assumes two cars per condo, plus space for a guest to park their car. This is not far off from real regulations, especially in car-dependent cities like Los Angeles. Parking is usually regulated for the worst-case scenario, and then some. Uh, take a look at hashtag Black Friday parking on the Twitter to see how generous these regulations are to parkers. One result of parking minimums is a huge increase in the cost of new construction, since all new buildings have to provide minimum parking. This has resulted in huge parking podiums and skyscrapers, while developments farther out need to acquire much more land for parking to comply with the code. In many cities, even rehabs required parking if the use was changed. A conversion from a warehouse to residential use required providing the parking for new residential construction, so renovations had to be paired with large-scale demolition of the adjacent urban fabric, or they just didn't happen at all. Uh, in many cities today, parking is the governing cost in any new construction, especially construction on a large scale. The height of a skyscraper is likely determined by the size and feasibility of the parking garage that can fit on the lot. Uh, in many cities, parking minimums have been lowered since their heyday in the 60s through the 90s, but very few have repealed them altogether. Furthermore, most parking which has been created through these regulations is private. Off-street parking is usually plentiful but expensive, while curbside parking is cheap and rare. This inversion of the usual price-demand relationship leads to folks complaining about the lack of parking even in areas with abundant parking garages and off-street parking which makes reducing parking minimums extremely difficult, politically speaking. Now, thankfully, many cities are taking steps today to lower parking minimums, especially near heavy rail transit stations. But so long as we insist on dragging one and a half tons of metal and plastic with us on most of our trips, the parking problem isn't going away anytime soon. Anyway, thanks for watching my YouTube video about parking. I hope it gets you thinking about parking. I uh, hope it gets you thinking about how to improve your parking in city skylines, but hopefully how to improve it in real life, too. Uh, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button, and I would like to thank my Patreons who are appearing on the screen right now. Uh, anyway, see you at the next video. Bye.